level, especially with those changes in Colorado. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I think you said it. Um, it's it's a bigger risk than you think. Ruben? Yeah, I'm a little bit nervous also because last year his home run to fly ball rate was 9%. His hard hit rate was down 10%. With that, he was only on pace for 15 home runs last year For if, if, it, if you extrapolate for the entire season. I'm a little nervous about him. And listen, if he moves and goes to a different lineup and he moves out of, moves out of Colorado, is that a plus or a minus? Is he going to still have the plus from losing the minus from going out of Colorado, but a plus to go into a better lineup? Because it's very possible they traded Arenado. They could trade Blackman just as well. Yeah, there's too many people going in round seven or at in an, even in an auction at that price point that uh, I, I have much better uses of my resources on on much less riskier players and with much different profiles that I that I want to get. So I, I'm passing on Blackman. Um, last player we'll do tonight. I'll let Derek go first. His name is Alex Verdugo. Your thoughts? So with Verdugo. I'm not convinced that we're going to get another level power wise. I think the batting average should be really solid. The run scored should be good. I think he's pretty much atop the lineup all season for Boston. I think the price is getting a little high for my liking. If you believe there's more power, you can justify him at ADP. I just don't believe it. I don't think it's in his profile. He runs a little bit. I don't think he's going to run a lot. I, I, I've, I want to look at him and say he's he's 24 and most 24-year-olds could still unlock something else. I just don't see it in the underlying numbers. A little surprised to see the strikeout rate jump up as much as it did for him last season, his first season in Boston, right? I mean, the parts of three seasons we saw in the big leagues before that, he was in that 13 to 16% range. Last year, he struck out 20% of the time. Still hits the ball on the ground a little bit too much for me to believe that we're going to get more than like a high teens home run total from him. Ruvain, you go next. Um, I think with Verdugo, it's a lot has to do with his injury and his injury history. He had an issue with his back last year. He's now a full year past that, which will help him. But just like uh, Clayton Kershaw, who had, back, who had a back issue and can flare up at any time. Same thing with him. I'd be a little bit nervous with him. Yes, he'll score a lot of runs bat- betting ahead of Devers and Bogarts, but I'm a little nervous about everything else. Okay, so here's my take on him. I think that there is reason to like him because of his kind of profile and because the stats that he provides to you, which are uh, runs, which is a batting average, and steals. I think that um, you know something around 8, 10 steals is actually a, po- a very big positive these days. Um, he, there are, he is one of three players um, to have in Z-score speak – uh, a positive Z-score in both runs, RBIs, and stolen bases. That means that he's better than the average of the player pool that gets drafted in three categories. Only, uh, Sorry, I should say there's only three players after pick 60. All right, So we're talking after the first four rounds uh, of, of a 15-teamer. Only three players do that. Uh, one of them is, is uh, Verdugo. Can you guys name the other two? Any guesses? Hmm. That just Segura? sounds like a Michael Brantley profile to me. Not Gene Brantley. Segura with steals, maybe? Gene Segura is somebody that ATC projects, and he's going in pick uh, 185. The other guy, Jose Altuve, still projected for you know, about 10 steals or so. Uh, I guess enough uh, uh, runs and batting average still. Um, but with my point here is that it's a profile that you don't see a lot. And again, as I said earlier, what's cheap late in the draft? It's the 25 to 30 homer, the big homer guys with a bad batting average. If you want to make use of the fact that there's plenty of guys later, you want to take a profile that's going to let you have options to do that. And Verdugo, for me, fits that profile. He's going to get you enough of the runs, which are hard to get later, um, enough of the steals that you know it's going to be a positive force, and the batting average is excellent. It's very excellent, actually. He's got he's almost two standard deviations projected above the average player. Um, you can take those big bopper homer guys later, more likely if you take an Alex Verdugo. It just opens you up more to the cheaper players. When I run drafts, I always keep a quantity of what are the best players that help diversify my my board. I want to be as balanced as possible, and I want players who show up as cheap and bargains. And the more you pick the categories that help out your profile, 
the better. And so that's why I like Alex Verdugo. And by the way, he's a $5 value according to ATC, a $5 bargain. Um, he's going in round nine. He's probably worth round seven production according to ATC. So you're getting a bargain player and somebody who's going to help your profile. And to be honest, even if he wasn't a bargain, even if he didn't have a jump in power and he stayed at 15 homers like ATC says – it still helps me with the roster construction. He's one of the guys that I prefer more in a draft and less in an auction because in an auction I can pop somebody else and there's somebody else of more value I want at that level. But in a draft, it helps me with the roster. So I, I like Verdugo for that reason. Any thoughts or I should say, Derek, any other comments about the outfield uh, player pool uh, up top and in the middle as we've been talking? Uh, nothing else. I do think as we went through that group in particular, though, like the Eddie Rosario price in drafts compared to the Nick Castellanos price is a really compelling reason not to draft Nick Castellanos. I think they are similar in terms of our categorical expectations. So I'd rather use that sixth round pick where you have to go to get Castellanos on something else. A closer, like you mentioned, that would be a great fit. Uh, a third starter maybe would be a possibility depending on who's there. So I'd keep that in mind if you're thinking about those players. Yeah, good points. Ruby? Yeah, this this player pool, you can, just like um, Verdugo, there are a lot of players in that 7 to 12 range for the outfielders that have 10 stolen bases. So you have to try to mix and match and, and construct your team accordingly. Yeah, the one thing I'll say is that uh, in terms of replacement level, if you're in a five outfielder league, uh, outfielder is the worst position. You, the, it gets the biggest bump in value. So if you had the choice between somebody with similar statistics who's a shortstop or an outfielder, uh, the outfielder does get the nudge because of the position. Uh, again, it's already baked into prices if you do it correctly with pricing, but just looking at the same statistics, uh, the outfielder should get a little bit of a bump because uh, it is a weaker position, at least according to my uh, statistics that I've calculated over here. All right. Well, uh, we've got one mailbag question for tonight. Uh, and Sharp asks, Yelly or Belly? <laughs> I guess that's Kristen Yelich or Cody Bellinger. What are your thoughts? So which one would you rather have? And they're going somewhat similar in the first round of the draft. Uh, who, who do you go for, Derek? Yeah, for me, the, the key difference is we have Bellinger still coming off of shoulder surgery. Yelich's injury at the end of 2019 should be a non-factor at this point. Uh, both are guys that I'm interested in at that one-two turn in snakes. They're two guys I like for auction purposes, too. Uh, I think with Yelich, he hits the ball harder. That, to me, is, is one thing that separates him from Bellinger at this point. And I actually trust Yelich's speed a little bit more. I think both players are likely to give you at least a dozen bags, but probably more mid to high teens. I think the difference for me is I, I see Yelich having one more level still in that category. So another another good toss up, but if I'm making a choice between the two, I'm taking Yelich. What about you, Ravine? I'm going to go Bellinger, even though he had the surgery. He, right now, they're only saying he's swinging with one arm. I think they're doing it just to be safe. I think he probably, if he really had to, like let's say he had to play a World Series game, he'd probably be swinging full strength, and I don't think it'll be an issue when the season starts. But it may take some time for to build up this power, but I do think that Bellinger may end up with more stolen bases than Yelich because Yelich only stole four bases last year. It didn't look like he was so much into running, and I don't know how comfortable he's going to be with with running at this point. I mean, I'm not saying he's not going to steal because a lot of his value, a lot of Yelich's value is in his stolen bases. But if he drops a little, a little bit in his stolen bases and, and Bellinger stays at that stolen base level and just lowers the power, a, a drop, I, I want Bellinger. Uh, I'm undecided at this point. Uh, I think it's sort of a coin flip. Um, you know, when it comes to injuries, I trust you, Ruvain, so... I'll probably take whatever answer. ATC says it's Yelich, by the way, by about a dollar, uh, but it's very close. Um, I don't know yet. I the, the, That answer, I think, has to do with spring training. And, well, my drafts will have at least a week or two of spring training in there. I got to see how these guys go. Are, 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 do, they, do they look healthy? Is Bellinger's shoulder okay? Is Yelich's knees okay? Um, I, I think I, I want to see some action first before I, I give that decision. Um, it's a cop-out answer, I know. So I'll go with Ruvain's answer until I see otherwise in spring training. Uh, there is one other point I do want to make about the outfield that I do remember. Um, Marcelo Zuna, if you're drafting him in a league, okay, and he's eligible only at utility, you should not 
think about him as I he's going to clog my utility role. And do you know why? Because he plays in the National League. And the National League is likely not to have a DH, which means Marcelo Zuna will be playing in the outfield. So even though your draft software and whatever league might force you only to uh, pick him in the utility spot, when you're valuing him, you should value him as an outfielder because he's going to gain that eligibility really, really fast. And sure, he'll clog up your utility role for two weeks to start, but then you can pick anybody else in there and shift him to outfield. That's something that you just should know. There isn't that many players, by the way, that are, that are going to gain that eligibility because of the NL who would have otherwise qualified. Uh, Ruben and I were looking at it the other day. I think Colin Moran is the only big player of note um, who will gain eligibility at a position, even though in most formats won't be DH eligible. So there you go. All right. Well, this is the end of – oh, I'm sorry. We have uh, – uh, sorry, Ruvain's injury update. Uh, we've got a couple of guys uh, to go. Go for it, Ruvain. Yeah, first of all, I'm going to make a uh, I have a list of com- some players coming off of sur- surgeries or injuries in the offseason and th- they're all systems go. You have Miles Mikolas who's all systems go, Steven Strasburg, Shohei Otani who actually showed a decrease in velocity which is a little bit discouraging right now, but so so far he's good to go. Eduardo Rodriguez is good to go and Matt Chapman's good to go. The Nelson Lamette, he's feeling good about um the manager Jace uh, Tingler is actually feeling very good about where Lamette is in his throwing program. He dealt with some elbow discomfort last year. He had a PRP injection, no surgery, so that's something to monitor. The Mets announced last week that Seth Lugo had surgery for a loose body in his right elbow. He was a candidate last year to steal some saves from Edwin Diaz. He's going to miss for about six weeks, so you'll probably see him back toward the end of May. And this just came out today that JT Realmuto has a small fracture in his right thumb. It will be immobilized for two weeks. The Phillies hope to be ready. Hope he, Phillies hope he will be ready for opening day. Thumbs down on uh, Real Muto there. Does that hurt his value, by the way, at all? It shouldn't because, I mean, he's he's if he's going to be ready to open day, it's not going to affect him at all. It may affect his power early on, but otherwise it, it shouldn't really affect him at all because he's still probably going to play the same amount of games. He's been pretty durable, and once that heals, it shouldn't be a problem. You drafting Real Muto, Derek? I haven't been, not because I don't like him, but this goes back to something you and I have talked about, I think, on Twitter at some point. Yeah, There are certain players in snake drafts, just where they go, it, it doesn't work, right? The the draft capital it takes to get them doesn't line up with what I need to get from them value-wise, and the pieces just don't fit quite right. Uh, so I pass on Real Mudo in snakes. I could very well have him in auctions. I do worry... A catcher with a thumb injury, at least his right thumb, so it's not the hand that he catches with. You just you think the possibility of, of having setbacks with that would be pretty high at that position. It's it's his throwing hand that's injured, so hopefully it's not as bad. But it's also uh, the way he bats; it's his bottom hand as well. So that's something you know to watch for his power early on. But otherwise, through the course of the season, if if the if the MLB plays 162 games, his value should not be dinged that much based on this. Yeah, and catcher, as you said, catcher is a position where I think snake versus auction is so different um, in terms of the players that I'd like for each of them. Um, but we'll talk about that on our catcher episode coming up next week. Uh, anyways, fantastic show, uh, Derek. I-, I knew it would be, a- and it was. Uh, why don't you tell the audience uh, where everyone can hear you, can read your stuff, and what's going on uh, Well, things Derek Van Riper? Sure. Yeah, you can read my stuff over at The Athletic. Uh, We've got our draft kit dropping next week, so that's not too far away. We'll have regular pieces. I'll have a regular piece almost every week, I think, starting next week through the end of the season. So a lot of writing coming up on the podcast front. Rates and Barrels, The Athletic Fantasy Baseball Podcast, and Fantasy Baseball in 15. uh, Three different shows that I'm on. Pretty much a podcast every day between all those shows. Actually, two podcasts every day with Fantasy Baseball and 15 being a, a quick hitter in the morning. So, yeah, check those out. And on Twitter, I'm at Derek Van Riper. I listen to all of those podcasts, uh, along with this one that you're on right now. Uh, they are fan- three fantastic podcasts there. Uh, I really highly recommend it. Of course, it's award-winning, so um, it's not just me talking. It's also the experts talking about that. Uh, and actually, two of those were, were nominated for an award. So you had uh, – we talked about probability. You had a 40% chance right off the bat there, right? Yeah, 60% chance that uh, I still could have lost. So. That's true. <laughs> was- That's true. It was, it was really nice to come away with it. Having having two finalists is, is a great honor, and it's uh, even better to get a win. Yeah, congratulations and very well-deserved. Uh, Ruvain, uh, how about you tell us about what you're doing? 
Well, first of all, I think you're uh, listening to this just to get your uh, leg up on the competition. I think you're just trying to figure out what their draft strategy is. But anyway, um, you can follow me on Twitter at